Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Catherine Price, a founder of ScreenLifeBalance.com and author, as you guys know, of How to Break Up Your Phone and then The Power of Fun back here. Um, I am absolutely delighted today, this is one of my delights, to get to introduce you to Kelly Leonard. And Kelly, you can turn your video on if you were up for it. Hello. Um, <laughs> Kelly is the Executive Director of Insights and Impl Applied Improvisation at Sec the Second City in Chicago, and I'm going to ask him what that means, because that <laughs> itself is a rebellious title. Uh, Kelly and I met when I was a guest on his podcast, Getting to Yes And. Um, he has overseen productions at Second City, including some people you may have heard of, such as Stephen Colbert, Amy Poehler, Tina Fey, etc. And I, and he's the author of this book, Getting, sorry, Yes And, How Improvisation Reverses No But Thinking and Improves Creativity and Collaboration. So I was absolutely thrilled to be invited on Kelly's podcast for many reasons, one of which is that I'm a huge fan of improv. Another is that I have a very funny personal story about taking improv and hating that part, which we'll work on. But, um, but I was thrilled to be on his podcast, and now I'm so excited to welcome him to our community for the Rebellion Week of the Funtervention. Um, so Kelly is a rebel in the most delightful sense of the word, and welcome, welcome to Rebellion Week. Thank you, Catherine. I'm like so thrilled that this is the, the topic and the theme. Well, let's start by asking you, why are you thrilled it's the topic and the theme? Um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's my life, uh, the way I've lived my life, how, how, how I've sort of thought of myself and my work. I mean, you know, getting to work at a place like the Second City, which was founded in 1959, you know, it's the, it's the first storefront theater ever in Chicago. Like that, that wasn't a thing. And I'm married to a comedy professor, uh, among other things. And, and my wife teaches about this stuff that really pre-Second City, so before 1959, comedy was like mother-in-law jokes. And what Second City did in, in sketch and improv, and then people like Lenny Bruce did in stand-up, was turn that on its head and use comedy as a way to challenge norms, as a way to talk about politics and sex and the things you weren't actually supposed to talk about. So it's like, basically rebellion, I feel, is in the DNA of my life and my work. So I realize I should back up a bit because not everyone on this call might be entirely familiar with what improv comedy really yeah. is. So can you tell us a bit about what, what the art form is? Yeah. So you, you probably know Second City from all the famous alumni that have come out of here, everyone from Nichols and May to Keegan-Michael Key and Jordan Peele and people like that. Um, and what we do when you come to a Second City show is we do two acts of scripted content and then a third act that is improvised. And that is when we're in a creative process, the place where we're trying out new scenes. Um, it, we're reminiscent of a cross between Saturday Night Live and Whose Line Is It Anyway? Um, I think what's interesting, and this does speak to my title now, because you know I, I produced the stages at Second City from 1992 to 2015 when I then wrote Yes And, um, and I've been focusing my time since then on stuff offstage. Uh, uh, improvisation, which is what we teach all our people here, um, we actually end up teaching a lot of improvisation to corporate clients and in healthcare settings. And, and if that surprises you, it, it might not if you didn't if you knew the origin story. So real quickly, in the 20s and 30s, there was a woman by the name of Viola Spolin, who was a social worker at Jane Addams Hull House on the south side of Chicago. And her job was to better assimilate immigrant children coming into her care. So she and a colleague, Nava Boyd, invented all these improv games and these improv exercises, many of which were in gibberish because the kids didn't always share language, but it allowed them to come together, communicate, collaborate, her son, Paul Sills, is studying at the University of Chicago, loves these games, teaches them to his friends, Mike Nichols, Elaine May, among others. They form the first improvisational theater in America called the Compass Players in 1957. That morphs into the Second City in 1959. So again, our DNA is actually in social work uh, that then got turned into entertainment. So a, a lot of what I end up doing now is figuring out interesting spaces that might need our improv training basically anywhere where it's vital for humans to work with other humans in an endeavor. Uh, so you can see why we m might be needed because uh, it turns out we're not very good listeners. We don't collaborate well uh, just as, as human beings. And I think uh, there, there's all the evidence that exists in the world that that's true. Yeah. And I also realized I should talk a bit about um, what made me. So in my book, I talk about yes. And, and I talk about improv and 
what you were just saying really reminded me of why I felt there was such a strong connection, which is that as people on this call likely know already, I define fun as the confluence of playfulness and connection and flow, which is exactly what you were just talking about in an improv context. Yep. And it's interesting to me to think that while improv exercises and games themselves might not be conducive to fun, I, again, I'm willing to be convinced, but for every single person, mm -hmm. I think that the philosophy of improv and the feeling that people get when they're in these games and, and also as the audience members in an improv show, that is very much what fun is. It's the essence of fun. And to me, yeah. there's so many aspects of what I learned from the outside about improv that seems so directly related. So I was wondering um, if you could speak a bit in terms of or a, a bit about what yes and means, sure. um, which I think ties into all of the things we've been discussing for the month about fun, whether it's in terms of rebellion or attracting fun more generally, but just to set the scene here, if you will, for yeah. people on this call, what is yes and? So, I mean, yes, it? yes and is the stickiest of improv concepts. And, and basically the idea is if you have two human beings uh, who are trying to make something out of nothing, uh, they get nowhere by saying no. They actually don't get that far by saying yes. We say you have to say yes and you have to affirm and contribute in order to explore and heighten. Um, when we, we uh, my wife and I co-led a, a, uh, an endeavor at the University of Chicago at the Booth School of Business called the Second Science Project that looked at behavioral science through the lens of improvisation and vice versa. And the guy who greenlit this was Richard Thaler. And actually, Anne, my wife Anne was doing a, a, um, a workshop with him, co-teaching it. And when he learned about yes and, he's like, wait, that's a nudge. And so if you know Thaler's work, he wrote the book Nudge. And in behavioral economics, we know that people's default position is to say no or do nothing. So yes and is literally a nudge to go the other direction. Um, and, and so much of improvisation is about reorienting our bad instincts, our instincts to shut things down, our instincts not to share, um, our, 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 in, our instincts to self-preserve. Uh, and when we can take the focus off of ourselves, and if you're playing a scene improvisationally, your job is just to make your partner look good. Um, and, and then it's interesting, so many... You, this this maybe it was like 20, 25 years ago, we, we recognized in our training center, we're like, there's a different kind of person uh, or persons coming into these workshops. And a lot of them were people suffering social anxiety. And you, you would think like, why would someone have social anxiety want to do an improv class? But, but, you know, talking to these folks, it's like, it's the only place where they can be fiercely in the moment where they're not worrying about what came before or what came after. And so it's like a respite uh, for them, but it's also an embodied practice in the thing that they're maybe having difficulty with. That reminds me of something you, you quote you had in the book, which I actually dog-eared, then I closed my book. Let me see, would you write that, um, at the second city, we do not teach you how to be funny. You don't learn jo jokes or one-liners. Rather, you learn to tap into the part of your brain that so often censors the truth for fear of being judged. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so interesting. I wrote a little note there and I wrote authentic authenticity as rebellion. And yeah. what you were just saying about people with social anxiety that made kind of tapped into the, it seemed connected. And I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about that, about this connection between our authentic selves and why that can almost feel like some kind of rebellion against what we normally do and therefore be freeing. Well, no one got into comedy because they're well-adjusted. Um, <laughs> you should know that. So, so the people who find themselves here are broken in some ways. And what I didn't really realize until I became broken in many ways is that like, we're all walking through this world with a lot of pain um, and trauma, uh, a lot. Uh, and, and that's not something I realized because people don't talk about it. In our work, you really can't be successful uh, unless you are talking about what's important to you, what's inside you, who you are, and that's going to include a lot of pain. And comedy includes a lot of pain. I mean, that, that's, my wife has a, has a whole equation around comedy and, and pain and truth and distance. And sometimes that pain's really available, and sometimes it's a little scaled back, but it's all, always present. So I think separate, so you have the professional application, which I think we've all seen, and we think about our, when you think about your favorite, like, let's say, stand-up, um, it is likely that their act and your first sort of exposure to them was them talking about a personal fault. So Amy Schumer does this, Patton Oswalt does this, Chappelle did this. I mean, that, that's, that, that is a, my wife refers to it, to it she says in improv, we perspective take, and in standup, uh, we perspective give. 
We have to give uh, the audience a, a way to understand who we are in the first few minutes so that they, that they hunker in and stay in. And what we know from a lot of social science is great leaders tell their journey and, and tell their difficult journey. And they show people that, that they can rise above that. That becomes sort of an inspirational thing. So that, that's one side of it. And then in the improv, the, the sort of practice element of this is this stuff is not just sort of God given. Like everyone, everyone thinks it's like, it, it's my wife's writing a new book and it's called Funnier. And the idea is at orientations, uh, a parent will come up to her because she runs a comedy major and they'll say, are you going to make my son or daughter funny? She goes, I can't make them funny. I can make them funnier. I, whatever it is that they have, we will then bring out. And in the case she taught Tina Fey and she taught Amy Poehler, that's really, really funny people. But there's a lot of people who just, they're not going to become professional, but what they can do is find the thing that is sort of uniquely them and find a way to express that. And it is really, really likely that that's going to be funny in some way. No one wants to hear your success story, right? Like I want your fiascos. That is what I'm, I'm here for is what I'm going to laugh at. I think it's also interesting just to think about the, the goal not being to be funny or funnier, but just to be authentic. I think that really stands out to me. It also stands out to me that when we typically, well, let me back up again and just say the yeah. reason I have a chapter about rebellion in my book is that when I collected stories from people about past fun experiences, and some of the people who shared those stories may well be on this call right now, so thank you. There was this theme that stood out of this playful rebellion of doing things slightly out of the ordinary, breaking a quote rule, no matter how mild that it might be, this unconventionality, often something that people did with someone else, because I think it is more fun often yep. when you have this rebellion with someone else. And I thought, is that's really interesting because it makes, it just seems very accessible. If you just start to think about your life towards the, through this lens of playful deviance, and yep. I think it goes against what we often think about rebellion, which is this kind of James Dean vision or something that's like legitimately yeah. dangerous or destructive. Rebellion, as you're saying, is actually allowing yourself to be vulnerable and it's allowing yourself to communicate and share and be human. I mean, I think that's just interesting to think about. Yeah, we have, we have a phrase here, uh, uh, re you should replace blame with curiosity. And uh, Francesca Gino has this great book called Rebel Talent, and she's a Harvard professor. She's been on the podcast, Become a Friend. And I found a quote. I was looking through it before I knew I was going to come on here. And she, wrote, she said, quote, curiosity is a way of being rebellious in the world. Ooh. Is that nice? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and I think it is. And I think that, that what, we, what we don't understand is the superpower that comes with basic curiosity. And when you can move that up your hierarchy of needs... Uh, when, when you can actually have that as, as a baseline, you're going to make all sorts of unusual discoveries because the reality is like people wildly overestimate their ability to understand what's actually happening in any given moment. We think we can understand another, another's mind. Guess what? We can't. We can barely understand our own mind. <laughs> and this, this, this is just, this is true. And so then if you can be humble and, and curious, sort of fiercely curious. Like that's where the amazing stuff happens. When I think about, I mean, I've had such a great front row seat to young brilliance, comedic brilliance. So my very first cast had Stephen Colbert, uh, Amy Sedaris and Steve Carell. Yes. And watching okay. them <laughs> improvise and create material and, and, and collectively make discoveries that, that they're sort of leaning into um, w was, you know, great. And not a surprise that they go on to do the kind of work they do because they're just like endlessly curious. I mean, I would have, my, my wife was Colbert's roommate in uh, college at Northwestern. And after they graduated, he was trying to uh, pay for rent by making futon frames in their basement because Jesus was a carpenter. Um, <laughs> so a lot of dots to connect in this business scheme, but I'll go with it. Okay. Yep. So, uh, <laughs> she actually got him a job selling t-shirts at second city to pay for rent because the fut futon frames weren't, weren't moving. Um, and that's, and he wanted to be sort of a poet jerk, uh, dramatic actor, but he found himself here and he was like, wait, there's, there's a vein of here of rebellion, which is something he's very interested in. I mean, I think a lot of people thought of the Colbert rapport in, in deeply political terms, which of course you, you can think about it that way and that exists, but he was very interested in language, 
uh, and media um, and understanding the interplay of those and the power they have to, you know, move people. Um, and I remember literally Ann and I in bed, first night of Colbert Report going, this is brilliant. There is no way he can keep this up. Right. I mean, like if you think back, like how yeah, I remember that, yeah. can you maintain this? And he kept doing it to, to the point that you're just like, this is unbelievable. And then he knew to stop, you know, like he was like, I, I can't, there's, there's no more here. And then he's got this, this thing that he's doing. So it's, it's, you see the examples uh, over and over and over again in, in our great artists uh, and, you know, comics, I, I don't know that you can be successful in comedy without being an outsider. Hmm. It's interesting, which is itself a form of rebellion of taking a step outside of whether it's convention or the way that your your perspective on things and seeing things a bit askew. Cho chosen yeah. or not chosen too. Sometimes it's, right. it's not, it's, sometimes you're choosing and sometimes it's, it's just saying to you, but when you're on the outside looking in, you, you see truths. You, you have the ability to see things that other people can't because they're in it. Um, and, and then if you're particularly gifted at talking about that in, in certain kinds of ways, those are the people that, you know, I, I certainly flock to. I, I, about a month and a half ago, I went and saw David Sedaris uh, talk at the Auditorium Theater here in Chicago. I'd never seen him, you know, do his stuff live. And I was just, I was just reminded of like, what a unique insight this person has, you who grew up, you know, gay in the South, just like a complete weirdo. Um, and you know, that, and, and Amy was the same way for in different ways, right? They're, they, they're just like, you know, just it, outsiders who then become our truth tellers. It's, it's weird. It's like you, you would think that, oh, we, we should be led by the people who are inside, but that's not how it happens. I don't think. Right. Right. And I think it's often, well, I would say as someone who I've never fully feel like I fit in, but so that can be painful, but there also is a freedom and a delight and a joy and fun to be had there. Which yeah. brings me to, I want to be sure um, that we get to, to do stuff with you or talk about things we can do. Like, it's great, great for us to talk yeah. about it, but how do we do this, Kelly? How do we become more rebellious or adopt more of the spirit in our everyday lives? All right. So I know you hate, I'm not going to make you improvise. I'm, Just don't but, make but pretend I pretend to be anything. Because look at this. I brought a call. I didn't even realize this, but look what I can do. Oh, yeah. I'll no, no. That. You're you are fully guarded against it. Okay. I'm not going to make anyone do anything, but I am going to talk you through a couple exercises because the reality is, the, these are muscles uh, that you need to build. Um, and they're also, um, they're practices. So one of the practices of improv and rebellion is divergent thinking. So essentially we like to think in patterns. We look for patterns, even if they don't exist. This is just what, what happens. And in great comedy, it's usually a pattern interrupted or a pattern, you think you're gonna go one way, right? And it goes, goes another. So how do you practice that, that muscle? We have an exercise that's actually been great in virtual formats. It's one of the first things we realized works just as well uh, here as it would live in a room. And it's called point and untell. So when we're in a virtual setting, we have uh, maybe about 12 to 13 different um, pictures of objects. And everyone's job is to point at that object and say what it isn't. Point and untell. That's all you have to do. So a ball comes up, you say garbage can or anything else. <laughs> and what you discover is it's hard. It is very hard to not say the thing that something is. And it's also easy to cheat. Like, I'm just going to say animals, you know, or, or whatever I it is. I was wondering about that. Can you pregame? Can you be like, you, I'm just going to say elephant circus. Somewhere. We're going to, you know, yeah, we're going to suggest Peter. that you don't. Uh, we're going to suggest that the, yeah, that, that, that is a, a way of sort of get, getting around the practice. Because the practice is of, of missing the point. <laughs> of missing the point, yeah. Practice missing the point. Practice getting it wrong. Um, I like studying for things. You, you're going to quickly determine what kind of student I am. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll make Look, a list of all the things I could say, and then I'll just I'll memorize it, and then I'll just go down it mentally in my mind when he shows me pictures of balls. Uh, the, um, improvisation is not easy for me, and I know I wrote the book, <laughs> but it's not. It's not. It, it is not. I didn't grow up an improviser. I, I'm very, and the reason my, my title has applied improvisation is my entire life, I'm just realizing this right now, I'm having a, like a personal epiphany that I'm now going to say to 128 people, uh, nice. which is I float between the inside and the outside. I have my entire life. 
I grew up with a fair amount of privilege. My dad was a well-known uh, uh, TV and radio guy here in Chicago. I, we grew up in Kenworth, Illinois, which was the richest you know, uh, suburb like in the world, very Republican. We were Democrats. I was a deadhead. I had long hair. I did drugs. I was like, I, I was youngest of six boys. And like, you know, so I was a bad boy, but I also had the skill set to be able to like go in and talk to anyone. And, and my teachers like me, you know, or then things like that. And certainly my career then is, is that. So as a producer at Second City, I was kind of the boss, but I needed to be the boss of all these people who basically are there to hate me because I represent <laughs> like the man. Um, so you have to figure out how to negotiate that and be able to talk to artists and get artists to trust you and then be able to also talk to business people and get them to support you. And so this, this ability to go back and forth is kind of my superpower, I think. And, and so I, I think I'm good at sort of seeing, you know, what improvisation is uh, with, without necessarily being like the greatest improviser of all time, because I think that's not the point. You know, there, there's many different ways you can enter into this world. Some do come here to make it a, a career and use it to, to go on. But I'd say the vast majority of the thousands of people who are taking classes at any given tens of thousands of people who are taking classes at any given time is for something else. It's 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 a reskill. Um, it's they had a breakup. It's they want to do better at work or they want to you know be better at public speaking. What, what whatever it is, it's some again. It's probably some pain point. Um, but yeah, th this this sort of epiphany is just a sort of inside outside thing. Is is a kind of a cool area to be that I just don't think is available to everyone. To be able to kind of float between these different groups and yeah. be in and out. That's interesting too, because I think it touches on the idea that many of us, at least on the outside, think of improv as purely being this like art form in terms of comedy or theater. But in reality, I mean, as you talk about at your book at length, it's so yeah. much about how you're approaching the world. And a bunch of Kelly's books talks about the art of careful listening and really attentively listening. And it occurs to me that when you're talking about being able to connect with these different groups, it's because you're listening and next to you with them and then you're improvising authentically be, you know tapping into whatever will connect with them but it's an improvisational mindset because you're not rigidly coming at it like this is my identity it's fixed I'm the rebel and I'm going to talk to you yeah. about I mean the rebel you know the bad boy in school so it is it's really interesting yeah. um so for the show for the show and until so we could just do that I mean that seems like something I want to do with like my, my husband and daughter tonight just for fun is just yeah. pull out some pictures yeah okay yeah, that's a good one. Um, there's a, a, my wife created this resiliency exercise that I love talking about, and it's very easy for anyone, anyone to do. So I think I've been thinking about this one since you told me about it. I love yeah, this I one. think I, yeah. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll, the, the setting is this, um, two years ago in March, everything shuts down. I work at a live theater where we do live workshops. I mean, literally we send hundreds of facilitators on the road, all over the world, every single week done over. <laughs> so um, the first two areas to pivot because we couldn't, couldn't get the live theater going were putting our training center, our, our school online, and then our corporate workshops online. I get a call from my friend who used to run or help run Yale exec ed, and she's now at a soft drink company. And she's like, do you have anything around resiliency that you can do online? Because my people are all, all suffering there at home and I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I just said yes without knowing that we actually have <laughs> yes, it. Yes, and I'll figure it out later. Exactly. Yes, and I'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, fake it till you make it. There's science about that. So I literally yelled downstairs to my wife. I'm like, do you have a resiliency exercise? She goes, honestly, I actually just created one for a, another workshop I was teaching. By the so way, Tyler, actually, you guys seem pretty awesome as a couple, just what oh, I know of the two of you. Yeah, like... we're actually co-writing the follow-up to Yes And, and, and started, I was working on the proposal because I was actually doing it by myself until I realized I'm just going to have to keep going to And for stuff. And this is what our life has been. We, we co-created a lot of are stuff you, together. Are you going to call it Yes And? It's, okay. <laughs> that would be, it's, the title is going to be Yes And to Thank You Because, and I'll explain that uh, okay. uh, a little later. Sorry, but, I didn't mean to interrupt you with resilience. Okay. You call down and says, yes, I have it. I will. And so yeah, here's, it. here's okay. the exercise. You get a piece of paper, you make three columns. In the first column, the exercise is called wish. In the first column, you write down a thing you could wish for that, that you can't have. So, so at that point, it was like, I really want to swim in the salt water. You know, I'm in, I, I can't get on a plane. I'm, I'm in Chicago. There's no salt, salt water. 
second column, you write down the emotion you think you'd feel if you were able to be granted that wish. So I wrote down refreshed. Uh, and then the third column, you write down something you can do right now to experience that emotion. And so I was like, oh, I could splash water on my face. I could work out or go for a run. And the idea here is we may not be in any sort of control of the thing that is happening to us, but we do have agency over our own emotional response. And again, putting our privilege and putting certain kinds of traumas and all that to a side, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about like sort of day to day and the way we sort of frame moving forward. Is it possible for us to operate with our own agency, understanding, you know, that we have these emotional lives that are real as well? Um, and, and then I realized a lot of our improv exercises, they're very Buddhist in nature. A lot of it is very much emptying out and non-judgment, you know, which, which we mentioned earlier, uh, it, no judgment of self or others, because you cannot be creative if you're in judgment. It is something I, I remember we did a class, we're, we're in a number of classes at Harvard and, and Francesca, uh, who I mentioned earlier, Gino, it was one of those. And she, she was talking about, she goes, I never thought of it like that, but you're right. You cannot be creative if you're in judgment. Mm -hmm. you, you can be, you can get into innovation. That's the, there's lots of judgment there, but being creative requires messiness and a kind of messiness that if you're going to be successful is it, it, with multiple people is only going to work if everyone's frame is anything goes as long as it's for the good. Yeah. And that, and that ties into, I think, fun directly, because I truly believe you can't have fun if you're judging. If, nope. if anyone's judging you, if you're judging yourself, judgment, fun killer. And it yeah. also ties into something you mentioned when we spoke before this call. And you, you mentioned, you said, to you, one of the ideas of rebellion is, is being someone who's, anyone who's willing to entertain a strange idea and to allow their minds to be changed, which I think yeah. ties into what you're saying. Uh, yeah, because yeah, we're, we're it's not, you, we all know this. It's like, it's very hard to, it's very hard to change minds. It's probably even harder for us to change our own mind. So that really requires a level of it's, it's discipline. I, I, I want to think about this a little bit. And so I want to get your feedback, but it's like, I don't think people recognize like to experience true fun requires a level of discipline. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> I you was going to call it two... hard work, but I thought it wouldn't sell as well. Right. Well, no, I but agree, it's but true. It, it's go on, true. Go on. <laughs> no, it's true. You, you, you know, so, so, so true fun, which has flow and the, and the other things you're talking about, like really requires a level of intentionality. And, and you talk about attention and, and, and attention being one of these resources that is so important and we're constantly giving it away or it's being taken away, like supercharged in these times that we live in. I didn't, I didn't grow up with the internet, thank God. I don't, I mean, you're younger than me, but I, I just like, I, like, I just went out and played. <laughs> Like, like there was yeah. no games. I mean, we did, a, we got Pong at some point. There was a black and white TV with Pong. <laughs> it's just like, it's so slow. I'm playing Pong right now. <laughs> it is so slow. You would just sit, I mean, that's what we had. And right. like Oregon Trail, if you were lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, but I do, I don't I know. it's a, a lot of intentionality. And we've talked, we've been talking this month about, you know, how do you create space for fun? Because the rest of life is going to rush in. Right. How do you actually be much more intentional about how you spend your time? And even in this sense of like, well, how do you attract fun? How do you get a fun mindset where you're training your mind to not just always focus on the negative and the things that cause you anxiety? Because that's naturally where our minds are going to go. So I think it is true. Like it does take effort and discipline, as you're saying. Um, but the result is so worth it. So I, I did, yeah. I started something, uh, during the pandemic with my now 24 year old son. So, uh, he had graduated as he says, zoom laude, uh, from college <laughs> the la last couple of months were on zoom. Uh, but you know, and, and, and then came back to Chicago wanting to be an actor when there were no acting jobs. Uh, he's, he's doing tech recruiting now he's making a bunch of money. He still wants to be an actor that, which I'm, I'm all for, uh, but we started like, Chicago is known for its Italian beefs, uh, Italian beef sandwiches. You really can't get them in a lot of different parts of the country. 
he and I both love Italian beefs. And so we decided to basically find the best Italian beef sandwiches in Chicago. And so for many, many uh, uh, weeks and weekends, and we actually just did this last weekend, we would seek out, so, like we'd look up different people's lists or whatever. But what was happening was it would require us together to drive 45 minutes. So we're having conversations there and then back to these suburbs where we don't go and encounter people like, like early in the pandemic, none of these people were wearing masks. I mean, zero. It, like, it was very funny. And, and there were quirky people and these were quirky places. And then we would rate these Italian beefs and then we put it up on social media. And there's this very funny Chicago face group, uh, Facebook group of, about Italian beef sandwiches and stuff that just yells at me that I've got it wrong all the time. <laughs> but I, I, I was talking to Jonah Berger about this, that like, no, I, I like there's, there's an intentionality that, that we, we did this thing together that was both a chance for us to bond without sort of like forced weirdness and then be open to these new experiences and places in our city that we wouldn't otherwise go. And I'm like, I didn't think about it in, the, in that manner, but now that I know what that is, I feel like, oh, I could probably design some other things that I might wanna do with my wife or with other friends that, that could have a, a similar sort of outcome. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something I've been thinking a lot about because of writing the book, the concept of playgrounds. Like, how do you create a structure yeah. that helps people let down their guard, have a new experience, get a bit out of their everyday routine? Because the result is like, like it doesn't really necessarily matter what you're doing. It's the fact that you did this together and that you had this new experience and that you came at it with this playful attitude. Um, yeah. I think that's great. As a side note, forced weirdness sounds like a great name for a book. Like forced weirdness. Yes, forced weirdness does sound. <laughs> oh. I've, I've got a friend who used to run IDEO uh, here in Chicago, Neil Stevenson, who's this very quirky Brit I just adore. Uh, but he, he does this stuff for himself. So he will go, when he was traveling, he'd go uh, into the Hudson News or whatever in the airport and buy a magazine that he had no interest in. And, and read that he also would uh over talk to his uber drivers and like really really <laughs> and he made all these discoveries and then of course because this is who neil is during the pandemic he went and got one of those airstream whatever th and he's just been driving around like the south like the play you know and and going all over uh the country just to sort of explore and he and his wife are just these that that's who they are they're endlessly uh curious and they're big much bigger risk takers than i am but that's interesting too because the rebe to me those are all forms of rebellion but it's a great example of the different degrees right you can have the yeah. rebellion of you just bought a magazine that's different from what you normally read might not sound like rebellion on its surface but you're you're breaking the norms of what you'd be breaking reading the norms. you're exposing yourself to a new experience yeah. right and then yeah. talking to your uber drivers like the next level up of like maybe you're normally kind of shy and you mm -hmm. don't really feel like doing it, but you went for it then the mm -hmm. next level up is buying the airstream and traveling yes, around right. the south. like that's <laughs> definitely rebellious most of us are probably going to do that but everyone could buy a different magazine so but you could buy a different yeah and and, yeah. and you've got again that's where you just got to start and you got to start somewhere and you might as well start with that. that's an easy thing to do it's an easy thing for me to go into Hudson News and buy Home and Garden, if that even exists anymore, or like a, <laughs> yeah, I'm not a sure motorcycle that. magazine or a fitness magazine. I have no interest in, in, in any of those things. And what will I potentially discover? And I think that's the thing for, for people who like taking improv. One of the things that they, uh, I think, enjoy is coming together with these people and experiencing them in a kind of depth that is unnatural. Uh, uh, because you, you reserve that kind of depth for like your best friend in college. And now you're doing it with a total stranger over the course of eight weeks. And then if you continue with the program, you're doing it the course, course of a year, which is why so many people who stick with improv have these lifelong friends that they make because they've, they've like so much eye contact. So much eye contact. Right. Well, I think it's interesting too, on these calls this month, a number of people have brought up in the chat that they've been taking, like one of the fun things they've done during the pandemic is taking improv over Zoom. So just throwing that out there again, that that is a possibility that to, I was yeah. very surprised by how well it sounds like it works, but it sounds like it yeah. really does. And I remember someone mentioning that they'd made friends with people all around the country. Oh, um, it, because it, they in, had, internationally. We have yeah. people like, like they'll be in Switzerland and Italy and Chicago and New York, and they're all taking classes together. So it's, it's like that there was an element of 
this was something I didn't expect with everything, but it was like, there was an element of equity and leveling and accessibility that being able to do this here, it's like, oh, like these things are cheaper, like a drop in class that we've got. So you, you may cut and maybe you're in a wheelchair or something like, like, and, and it's hard. So the idea that this would also have this sort of issue of accessibility was a complete surprise to me. And, and it's never going to go away. I think, you know, that's the interesting thing is we're back open both as a theater and as classes, but we now have this virtual business, which, which we wouldn't have known had we not just sort of yes and the whole thing and said, yep, we're going to pivot and do it. And that's in, that's, that's in our collective DNA here, which is why we're, we're able to like take a crisis and turn it into an opportunity. I, but I wouldn't say that that is the norm in corporate America. <laughs> I think it's such a great, it's a great attitude. Um, I want to be sure to get to the other two exercises I know you were going to describe to us, but I was going to say in terms of the accessibility, it's interesting you mentioned that because I have a friend who's a high schooler who's in a wheelchair. She's this amazing uh, writer and advocate, but she wrote a whole editorial about how Zoom school for her was actually great because yeah. she was just uh, one of the like kids. She, no kids. one was seeing the wheelchair or judging her because she was in a wheelchair and it was actually very liberating and, and a, a good experience for her. So it's interesting to think about these different perspectives. Um, I'm hoping to, if anyone has a last minute question, if they want to drop it in here, but um, I could talk to Kelly all day. I was going to quickly uh, re so we have the show, the name don't, wait, the show don't tell. The, no, 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 the name, don't tell me the name of that one again. With point and untell? Point and untell. We've got point and untell. We talked about wish. Someone wish. was just asking. So that's basically put something you wish you could do, the emotion that it would produce, and then brainstorm alternatives. So that's a, a something you could do right now to experience that emotion. Yeah, yeah. And that I think we touched on actually in a previous call when we were brainstorming, there was a woman named Gretchen who uh, inadvertently became our volunteer and we were brainstorming things she could do that weekend to satisfy some of the reasons that she loves to travel, why travel is such a fun factor for her. And right. the people in the chat came up with some great ideas. So we've got those two ideas. What else should we try, Kelly? All right. So this is this is one that we used uh, uh, on our kids when they would like fight in the car. Um, is, there's an exercise called word at a time. And basically, it's very simple. Uh, maybe there's four of you in the car. You're going to tell a story one word at a time. Uh, and so what, what, when my kids were little, like my son was very like natural on this. Uh, my daughter, every time I came to her, she would say like hamburglar, <laughs> dinosaur, even when it was really, we needed an uh or a the. And one of the lessons you learn, because everyone wants to win a game. This is why the, the games are or good practice uh, is to to kind of win the game. She was going to need to master uh, how to move the conversation forward, and she got really good at it. So it was like, no, like us and thus are really important. And maybe you'll get a juicy, you know, adverb. I don't know. Like, <laughs> but but it is it's it's basically a practice in sharing a conversation. Also, it forces you to listen to the thing that the other person is saying. We have so many listening exercises. Uh, around this stuff, because honestly, we we do not listen to the end of sentences. We don't, and when you do, um, you make a lot of a lot of discoveries. And I'll give you one other exercise, uh, which is called "Take That Back." Um, and it's two people uh, uh, and a third who has a bell, uh, hopefully. Um, and the two people start having a conversation. Maybe they're given a location and characters. Doesn't matter. Uh, anytime the person hits the bell, the person who just said whatever they said has to take it back and say something else. And sometimes they'll hit that bell like 10 times. Um, this is again, it's kind of, it's divergent thinking, but, but it's also like, what happens when we open ourselves up to the possibility that there are a bunch of alternatives? When we don't just land on the thing that we land on. And, and what you discover is that, that you usually find something pretty funny or curious or unusual when you just don't go with first thought, even second thought or third thought. Um, and this is important because one of the key things around yes and is we want to create from abundance. So when we're putting up a new show at Second City, it's like a 10 week process. The first four weeks are all yes and. We put up every idea, no matter how dumb, because at some point that dumb idea, maybe combined with this other idea is where we make the amazing invention, which is basically an innovation process, right? This is like, they didn't know that they were making post-its, like, like that, that became a thing when someone was like, oh, it could be used in this way. And, and, you know, and then someone's probably a millionaire because of that. And it might be Mike Nesmith's family, or she, she was something, she might've been white out, I forget, uh, the monkey. 
Yeah, his, his uh, mom. You know what I'm talking about? I'm not sure that I do, but I'm really trying to listen to the end of your sentences, so keep talking. That's fine. Yeah, Mike, not, Mike Nesmith's mom made a fortune. Uh, yeah, it's white out with uh, discovering white out. Um, but yeah, so so this uh, take that back is a great game for for getting in that sort of abundant mindset, that discovery of what potentially exists that we're not. Uh, for anyone's familiar with Danny Kahneman's work, uh, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, improvisation is constantly switching between system one, system two. System one, system two. Like you, you to do this, you have to like completely focus and then completely take it back and, and invent. Um, and again, system I think one the, is the total focus and system two. I always forget which one. It's, yeah, I think system one's the fast. Like what, what am I seeing right in front of me? You're a girl, you've got a red shirt like that. And then when I sit back and I think about the broader, like what might be on your mind, what, what might you not be saying mm -hmm. um, and, and all that. So you have to like play with what literally is given to you. This is the yes and, but then to be, an interesting improviser, you then have to invent where that world could go that would be more than just a banal conversation because no one's going to watch that or think it's funny. Can I ask, well, oh, so we have a question from Sherry about some other good listening exercises or games. There's actually a ton in this book. He's actually got a whole list at the back. So back, I recommend yeah. uh, checking out a copy of Kelly's book. And I would also assume that if you look up improv games, you'd be able to find some, but a lot of the ones you're talking about. They're on the internet. There's lot, lots of different ones. The, the key, the key I'll keep holding on. Uh, like, Anyone can improvise, anyone can do these games. The reason you come to a Second City or another sort of expert improv uh, uh, training center is because the way you teach these exercises and what the point of focus is, we have people who are masters at teaching that. And if you, you're you just kind of doing it yourself, it, I don't think you're gonna have a transformative experience. To get the transformative experience, you wanna be working with a professional. I'd also say you probably would be working with them um, with, yeah, like I think that, Kelly and I have talked about this before. My improv experience might have been better if I had been at Second City or yeah. maybe if I'd have been in this phase of my life. But I was, I just felt so, yeah, it was not, it was not like this. Um, no, no. And yeah. we're, we're, but we're, I, I mean, we're in the Midwest. There, there's an element of, of that. There's a lot of non professionals who are there. There's a great age range. Uh, and so, yeah, sometimes it is like, you know, sometimes you have a class that doesn't gel, that happens on occasion. Um, but I do think, yeah, you, I, I suspect you would have had a different experience, but I also knowing, I don't like, I don't like going to improv shows and being, uh, uh, uh pulled out from the audience. I do not, I don't want to go to any interactive theater and I spent my life making interactive theater. <laughs> right, right. It needs to be a voluntary I get that. buy in. Um, well, we we're just about out of time. I did, there is one more question in the chat. I was hoping we could just have you touch on for a second. Um, before we wrap up and that is from leslie who is asking so thank you for offering this webinar you're welcome thanks for being here what is the relationship between improv and the play muscle we have but may not use daily and i think that uh -oh. you've touched on that a bit but any thoughts that's, that you have on that yeah that's that's everything i mean you, you the um think of it that this way when you take an improv class let's just say at a, a regular training center that's three hours of your time without your phone at all you can't look at it. Um, it is uh, these ver variety of exercises that you're going to be doing in different combinations with, with other people are going to require you to literally play with the muscles that you're talking about. Those of our, our, our attention, our listening, our non-judgment, uh, getting and, and knowing that the successful uh, gameplay is going to resemble flow. It, it's 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 going to completely resemble that because you are just like there's nothing in the world except the thing you're trying to achieve in the moment with the other person. There there's a a, a sort of famous uh, vial spolen exercise uh, called parts of a whole, where basically the job is one person at a time. Someone's going to uh, come up and and strike a pose or a, a movement, and they're going to build a thing together. So you might have in mind that well, I'm going to be part of an alligator, but by the end it becomes you know, a, a, a car wash, uh, that's okay. People are just building on it and finding what happens when all of us add our thing to this. It's just the, the job of the group is for everyone to be part of a whole. And that, that again, there's a simplicity to this, but there's also um, some deep meaning to this because um, especially in the world we live in right now, we're, we do so much blocking. 
Um, I, I hate the term cancel culture. I think it's complicated, but, but, the, but the idea, we're not doing this together. There doesn't seem to be an interest in doing this together. I don't know how we do this any other way. I don't know how the human experiment works when it's two factions that don't, I, I, I don't, I don't, what's the alternative? Endless civil war? Point? What's the point? And what's the point? Yeah. And, you know, Dan Gilbert has that great phrase or, or thing he says where if, if an alien came down uh, to the world and met one person, uh, they'd understand 97% of, of humanity because <laughs> we are that much alike. Um, we're all our unique selves, but we also like really like we value a lot of the same things. We just maybe talk about them differently or, or our order is a little di different, but I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I like most of the people I meet. I, I, f I find that the jerks and they exist, but they, they stand out. And I think there's an, an active rebellion in seeing people for them, their humanity instead of for allowing sure. your own instincts or for them to categorize themselves. So I think, I think there's something so powerful. And I, I also wanted to say, you know, that I personally, even though my improv class that I took was an uncomfortable experience for me, it changed my life. Like I think that, yeah. that understanding the philosophy behind it and just approaching life with this spirit of a yes and, or just, I mean, the, the active listening or just being open to things fundamentally like helped create who I am today and made my mm -hmm. life so much richer and more rewarding. And I would say directly led to the books that I've written. And so I'm, yeah. I guess what I'm saying is if someone out there is like, I don't want to get together with a group of strangers and pretend that I'm a sculpture. Don't worry. Right. It's no, like, you, you don't have take, to do that. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. It's all about taking the spirit of it or taking whatever part of the philosophy resonates with you and applying that to your own life in ways that do feel good to you. And then maybe being open to experimenting with some things that might feel more uncomfortable because who cares? Like, what's the worst that can happen? Nothing truly bad happened to me as a result of that improv class, except that like now I'm getting to have this conversation with Kelly, right? So that's pretty yeah. awesome, actually. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so thank you everyone for making the time for rebelling on a work day to take 50 minutes to spend with me and Kelly talking about rebellion. That counts as an act of rebellion. I hope it, that it was enjoyable to you because I had a great time. I totally got a kick out of this and I'm, I'll be thinking about it for the rest of the day. Kelly, thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to share with us. I am um, honored. Thank you. Yeah. And I can't wait to hear about what acts of playful deviance and rebellion everyone does uh, in the week to, and months and years to come. So thank you, everyone. Um, and I hope that you have great weeks. All right, take care.